Well, thank you for that, James and Hannah, that that last song truly ministered to my heart. Um, well, as you probably know that they are all over the world, uh, probably millions of people who are worshiping Christ today. And really, to worship means that we ascribe worth to something or someone. And for us as Christians, it is recognizing God's for he, God for His attributes and His character, for His Word and His works. And it is often expressed through, through praise and through thanksgiving, through obedience and service, and also through our godliness and holiness. So it is vertical when we focus heavenward to where God is seated. It is horizontal as we seek to, to live out our lives in this world and loving others. And it is internal as we seek to grow in holiness and conformity to the likeness of Christ. Acceptable worship to God is worship that comes from our heart, that comes from a heart that is pure and hands that are clean. Uh, Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4 reads, Who may ascend into your mountain, O Yahweh, and who may arise or may arise in your holy place? He who has innocent hands and a pure heart, and has not lifted up his soul to worthlessness, and has not sworn deceitfully. So true worship is to worship God in spirit and in truth. Uh, it is worship from a pure heart, a new heart, a circumcised heart, a clean heart. And today we come to a passage, really, that, that rocked the world of the disciples, that rocked the world of Judaism, the world of the Pharisees and the scribes, and went on to rock the world of the, of the Gentiles. Uh, in our passage today, Jesus made a, really a... A lightning rod pronouncement, a new covenant pronouncement that he would set free captives to a legalistic and ritualistic worship of him. So please turn to Matthew chapter 15. Um, and as you turn there, I'll just remind you of what we have found before. We have found that Jesus was opposed by the religious leaders at this time in, in chapters 11 to 13 and and we are now in chapter 15, and the first part of chapter 15, the Pharisees were seeking to, to uh, discredit Jesus by bringing against him accusations of not keeping the traditions of the elders, of breaking the ritual of cleanliness, accusing Jesus' disciples of not washing their hands and therefore being defiled uh, and therefore uh, being a transgressor of the law, where Jesus, in effect, turned around and accused the, the, the Pharisees to be hypocrites, to be false worshippers of God, showing them how to be actually breaking the clear commandments of God in their attempt to keep the traditions of their elders. Their worship were insincere and false. Uh, and then Jesus made this lightning rod the shocking statement, uh, one that I said shook the Pharisaic system of worship to the core, one that struck at the foundations of the traditions of the elders. Jesus pronounced that ritual defilement is not spiritual defilement, that ceremonial defilement is not moral defilement, or stating it the other way around, that ritual cleanliness does not mean you are spiritually clean. And ceremonial cleanliness is not the same as moral cleanliness. Now, that doesn't sound much to us, to our ears in our day, but it was a profound statement, a radical pronouncement in the, to the Jews of Jesus' day. And it's really a shot across the bows of Judaism that, the coming, that with the coming of the King, the coming of Christ Jesus, the worship of God will be radically different, dramatically changed, no more dominated by the rituals and ceremonies of cleanliness, ceremonial cleanliness, but by the renewal of the heart. And so read along with me from verse 10 in chapter 15 of Matthew. 
After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Then the, Pharise the, sorry, then the disciples came and, and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Now Peter answered and said to him, Explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, Are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and goes into the sewer? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you, Lord, and, and thank you for the ministry of your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. I pray, Lord, that today what we do not know, that you will teach us. Lord, that what we have forgotten, that you would remind us. Lord, and that which we stand in error of, that you would convict us and bring us to a true understanding of you and your word. And so bless us this morning, Lord, through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so this morning, our passage really teaches us that true worship, as acceptable worship, comes not through rituals, but through or from a renewed heart, a clean heart, so that we would offer up not a heartless, mindless worship, but true worship to God, genuine worship to God. And so the first thing I want to show us is that it is not through rituals. True worship is not about the external. It is not the ceremonial. It's not the ritual. It is about the heart of God. Acceptable worship comes from a clean heart, a renewed heart, a, not, not through rituals or ceremony. And Jesus, having rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes for their false worship just in the, in the verses before, called the crowd to him. They were probably standing off at a little bit of a distance out of respect for, for, the, for the religious leaders. Um, but now Jesus wanted them to, to come closer to hear. He wanted them to hear what he said to the Pharisees and the scribes. He wanted to make sure that they understood what he said. So, and he, and he, he called them and he said, hear and understand. This was a way for someone to grab someone's attention, say, listen up, pay attention. What I'm about to say is, is of real great importance. Now, what Jesus said was not hard to understand, but for the Jews of his day, it was very hard to accept. The greatest stumbling block to receiving Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Lord, Jesus as King, was and is not acceptance. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not understanding. It is the lack of acceptance. And we find this true even today. When the gospel is presented most clearly, it also proves at that time to be most unacceptable to the lost. And Jesus wanted to use this accusation against him and his disciples to teach that they were ceremonial unclean, that they have transgressed against the traditions of the elders. That was the accusations. And so they, he wanted to make an object lesson against this ritualistic, pharisaic, legalistic worship that was external, ceremonial, where the visible is paramount, but the heart is left out. The heart is left behind. It is uninvolved 
and overlooked. Such worship elevates the practice of rituals and of the rituals of religion over the heart of worship. Acceptable worship to God must always flow from the heart of the worshiper. And so verse 11, it says, it, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the man, mouth, this defiles a man. And really the key word in this passage to understand is the word defiled, used five times in this, in this section. And what Jesus was saying in short, that God is concerned about defilement. But it is spiritual defilement, it is moral defilement, not physical defilement that he is concerned about when it comes to worship. The word defiled literally just means common or unclean or unholy or, or profane. Um, and nothing and no one defiled was allowed to come and worship or to be used in worship of God at that time. And so there was this fastidious focus on the rules, on the regulations surrounding ceremonial cleanliness and the rituals to achieve ceremonial cleanliness. Eating with, with unclean hands was defiling according to the traditions of the elders. But Jesus said a person cannot be spiritually or morally defiled by what he or she eats, what enters their mouth. One is not defiled from the outside, from the physical that enters a man, but from the inside. Mark, Mark chapter 7 uh, really states, uh, explains to us that in making this statement, Jesus declared all food to be clean, to be acceptable. And of course, Paul uh, affirms that in, in 1 Timothy 4.4 4, when he says, Every, For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. But so here the, our context deals specifically with eating with unclean hands. And the Pharisees and the scribes argued that eating with unclean hands contaminates your food, whether that was clean food or not, ceremonially clean, and that will therefore make you unclean as you eat unclean food. And therefore you would be unfit, or un your worship would be unfit and unacceptable to God, or you are not able to minister before Him. But Jesus asserted that defilement is an internal problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a moral problem. It is a heart problem. The Pharisees focus on the hands, but Jesus was saying, look at the heart when it comes to worship. It is not one, it is what one say. It was one that that displays really the defilement of the heart. Pollution of the heart renders a person unclean, defiled. And it is usually heard from the lips of your mouth, what goes on in the heart, or seen in your deeds or attitudes. And so Jesus was warning the crowds, don't be deceived, don't be misled. Listen and understand the washing of hands before eating has nothing to do with making you morally or spiritually acceptable to God. It has no effect on the heart. It is the heart of man that is the source of his defilement. And this is, this is not radical to us today, but it was a profound statement to the Pharisees and the scribes who have been teaching the, the people this very thing. It was a revolutionary statement that abolished the hold that the Pharisees and the scribes had on the people. It destroyed their bases that they used to control the people of their, of, of their day. It was a revealing statement exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes. One commentator, John Phillips, said this of Jesus' words. In one sweeping statement, he had denounced the entire structure by which the rabbinical schools, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and the religious leaders secured their hold on the multitudes. He labeled their religious rules and regulations, their exegesis, 
and the spirit stifling, God dishonoring, Bible contradicting, man enslaving, soul destroying, ego building, Satan serving tradition as worthless. Just as strong a statement as Jesus made back in the first century. And no wonder the disciples came to him and said, did you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you were saying? They were scandalized, literally, that you put a, a stumbling block in front of them, causing them to stumble, causing them to stumble in anger against you. But Jesus was not seeking to comfort the Pharisees and the scribes in their error. He sought to convict them of the error of their ways. He sought their conversion. However, the truth that Jesus spoke did not convict them. It only served to harden their hearts even more. The truth was Jesus ripped off their mask of hypocrisy so all could see who they truly were, and they resented that. The Apostle John wrote in his gospel, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And the deeds of the scribes and the Pharisees were exposed by the light of Christ, the truth of his words, and they were offended by it. They were angered by it. And so Jesus answers them and says, Every plant which my father did not plant shall be uprooted. Again, an incredibly strong condemning statement. A word of warning to these Pharisees, a word of judgment. You see that the figure of a plant uh, was, was often used as a symbol for God's true people in the back. And, and it has, it has its uh, background in the Old Testament. Uh, they are described, this is the people of God, as the branch of my own planting, the work of my own hands, Isaiah 60, 21. As a well-watered garden, Isaiah 58, 11. As the Lord's vineyard, Isaiah 5, 7. God's true people are at times compared to a flourishing tree, as Psalm 1 reminds us in Psalm 92. And so this symbol of a plant being, of being the true people of the God was, was well known and, and widely used as a symbol among the Jews for God's people. But Jesus said, they are not planted by God. They do not belong to him. I mean, Jesus could not have made a stronger attack on the Pharisees. Accusing them of not being the true vine which God had planted. That they were not part of God's true people. Jesus himself taught in his parable on the kingdom of heaven that it will be full of wheat and tares. That God the Father planted good seed in his field, the wheat. And then the enemy came and planted tares among the wheat. And Jesus, in effect, was saying, the Pharisees are tares. They are not planted by God. The tares which are not planted by God, Jesus explained in Matthew 13, that they are the sons of the evil one. These tares, these sons of the evil one, will be allowed to coexist with the wheat until the harvest time, until judgment day, when the tares will be collected and thrown into the fiery furnace and the wheat collected into the barns of God. In our passage, Jesus said that God the Father did not plant these leaders. They will be uprooted. They will be removed in judgment. God will deal with them. He will deal with these scribes and Pharisees who appear to be confident teachers of his will and his ways while they don't know him, while their hearts are far from him, while they worship him in vain. True worship comes not through rituals, but from the heart of man. Verse 14 says, leave them alone. 
They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a, a blind guide, a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Ignore them. Pay them no attention. Stay away from them. Disassociate yourself completely from them. They are blind guides of the worst kind. Because their blindness is self-inflicted. They loved darkness rather than the light as when the light exposed their deeds. Their blindness is self-deluding. While blind themselves, they believe they were the only ones who sees. They believed they had the light. They believed they knew the way. That they knew the truth. That they have eternal life. While they were blind to the light of the world. Blind to the way, the truth, and the life that was standing right in front of them. They were offended by him. He was to them the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense that Peter speaks of in 1 Peter 2.8. So leave them alone. They are blind guides leading the blind and they both will fall into the pit. Really the pit here in, in our little illustration is a literal hole. I mean a blind person who can't see will, is liable to or likely to fall into, into a, a, a ditch or a, or a hole. But spiritually the pit refers to hell. And that is where these false guides will lead their blind, their, their, their blind guides will lead their, their blind followers into the pit of hell. It's incredibly strong words by Jesus. And so we need to take heed of this warning to stay away from blind guys, to stay away from the false teachers and the false prophets. The scriptures are just repleted with warnings against false prophets and false teachers. Those who come in, in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7, 15. Those who disguise themselves as servants of righteousness when they are really angels, of the, uh, the, uh, messengers from Satan, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. Those who bring you, who seeks to bring you into bondage again, Galatians 2, 4, to the empty philosophies uh, and the traditions of men, Colossians 2, 8. Those who have succumbed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, forbidding marriage and abstaining from certain foods which God has enjoyed with thanksgiving, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 4. Does that mean that we should never engage a false teacher or a false prophet? No, I think we are called to witness to them, to give the gospel to them, but to do that with great, great caution. To be careful not to fall under their influence, not to imitate their ways. True worship of God is offered not through rituals, but from a renewed heart, a clean heart. Verse 15. Now Peter answered and said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and goes into the sewer? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. Peter here was, was obviously not asking about the illustrations of the plant and the blind guides. He, he got that. He was asking Jesus about this pronouncement, this about defilement coming from the outside and not from within. And he calls it a parable because he, 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 he thinks there is, there's, there's, this is a difficult teaching, a, a, a sort of a mysterious teaching, but it is not difficult to understand. Jesus was very straightforward and very clear. To them, it was not difficult to understand, but it was difficult to accept because it cut across all that they've been taught all their lives. Peter asked the Lord, what, what, what did you mean? You see, every day... 
their everyday life was saturated and dominated by religious requirements for ceremonial cleanliness. There were so many of these rules that even the professionals, the rabbis and the Pharisees, had difficulty keeping them all. And so they developed the law of intention, the law of Kavanaugh, which allows someone to say, I intend to be pure all day. And then when they fall or fail to fulfill these religious or requirements, the ceremonial requirements, it is not that big a deal because their intention was to be pure. Their intention was to be clean. See, most of these laws and traditions were actually extrapolated from the law of Moses, specifically the book of Leviticus, which gave detailed instruction on how people were to conduct themselves and, and how they should worship God as the people of God under the Mosaic Covenant, which God made with them at Mount Sinai. And these laws would govern which animals were clean and unclean, or what can be eaten and, and how it should be prepared. These laws declared what was unclean and clean, and some, well, some sicknesses like leprosy was, was considered unclean, menstruation uh, rendered a woman unclean, touching a dead person, when you get sick, all of that meant you are unclean. You are ceremonially unacceptable to participate in religious ceremonies or even social activities. However, being ceremonially unclean, ceremonially defiled, was never on a sin in and of itself. Ceremonial Cleanliness is nowhere, or uncleanliness is nowhere directly considered sin. It was to serve as a picture of sin, as the separation that sin caused between man and God, and, and between men. For example, it is, it is not sinful to menstruate. It is not sinful to, to touch a dead person when a, when a relative dies and you have to deal with that. It is not sinful to touch that. It's not sinful to be sick. But you are considered ceremonially unclean. And being ceremonially unclean requires you to be, go through the ritual of cleanliness, ceremonial clean, cleanliness, not the forgiveness from God. You were never asked to, when you ceremonially unclean, you did not have to bring an offering in the sense to remove the uncleanness. There's normally a, a, a process and then a washing that you had to go through. And so the laws on ceremonial defilement served as a practical illustration of the spiritual defilement sin brings. This, these ceremonies, ceremonies and these rituals never made one right with God. Keeping them was never intended to make one morally acceptable to God. The Old Testament is clear. One is righteous before God when one believes in God and believes his word. As with Abraham who believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Even the external ritual of circumcision was also a physical sign pointing to the need, really, of spiritual circumcision, the circumcision of the heart, the cutting away of sin from one's life, and the yielding to God. And so these external rituals and practices, the rules regarding who is defiled, and the need for ceremonial cleanliness, served as vivid illustrations that coming to God in worship, one has to come with a clean heart, a spiritually pure heart, a renewed or a washed 
hard. And forbidding someone to worship while they are unclean, ceremonially unclean or defiled, was to say, don't come to God in worship when your heart is unclean, when your heart is defiled, when you are spiritually defiled by sin. Now for the Jews and for Peter and the disciples who, lives, who lived in that era with dominated by these laws, these traditions, these ceremonies, these rituals, it was hard to accept that, that the physical defilements do not actually spiritually defile you. But Jesus pointed out to them, true defilement is spiritual defilement. And spiritual defilement comes from within, from the heart. And the only remedy for spiritual defilement is a spiritual cleansing. It is the forgiveness of God which Jesus came to accomplish for his people. So heart renewal is by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is the mediator of the new and better covenant based on better promises. He is the high priest of the new covenant. He is the once for all perfect sacrifice, which will take away all of our sins completely and cleanse our hearts and our consciences perfectly, completely. And really, um, if you look into this, uh, the book of Hebrews really is a, is a spirit-inspired commentary on the book of Leviticus. But Peter and the disciples found it very hard to accept, particularly Peter. Many years later, Peter had to be taught this lesson again while on a roof praying, and the Lord gave him a vision of a sheet coming out of heaven full of animals, clean and unclean animals, and said, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord. I have never eaten anything that was considered unclean. And then the Lord answered him and says, no longer consider what is unclean, what God has pronounced as clean. And this, of course, led to the ministry of Peter to the Gentile, to Cornelius, taking the gospel to him. Uh, the, Jew, uh, the Gentiles, of course, was considered by the Jews to be unclean, defiled. And Peter had to explain that to the, to the council in Jerusalem. Um, and so it was hard for them to let go of this. Because really, that was, as I said, dominated their life. That, that really defined who they were as, as a people, as, as, as a Jewish nation, was, was these laws that caused them to be separate, to be different, to be holy to other nations. But Peter has now a new identity. Identity is in Christ. He's now no longer merely a Jew, but a Christian who happens to be Jewish. And still later, Peter still struggled with him when he withdrew from the Gentiles and stopped eating with them out of fear of the party of the circumcision which arrived and Paul had to rebuke him over his hypocrisy over this. We read that in Galatians chapter 2. And so coming back to Matthew, Jesus patiently explained what he meant to his dull disciples. That's literally what Jesus said. Are you still lacking in understanding also? It really means, are you still so dull? Are you still foolish? Don't you get it? After all of this time, it is not the physical the outside that defile, it is the condition of the heart. It is the spiritual, the spiritual corruption inside, the moral defilement inside the man's heart. That is what defiles a man and renders his worship unacceptable. And Jesus used quite graphic language to drive his point home here. He says, what goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and goes into the sewer, literally the toilet. But what comes out of the heart of the man, that is what defiles a man. From the sewer of the heart flows what is spiritually vile and defiling 
And this is what Jesus was getting at. The heart often used, well, predominantly used in the, in the, in the, in the Bible, uh, speaking of the whole person, the inner person, your thoughts, your attitudes, your desires, your loyalties, your, your motives. It is the seat of a man's character. And what comes out of the heart really reflects the true person, who you really are, not just what you appear to be outwardly. And no outward obedience is of the slightest value unless the heart turns to God. True defilement, spiritual defilement comes from within a person. And what comes out of the mouth comes out of his heart. And out of his heart also comes not only his words, but also his deeds, his attitudes, his motives, his desires. The heart is what most readily is most readily displayed through our lips, through what we say. What flows from the fountain of your heart? Sweet water or bitter water? Vile thoughts or clean thoughts? Evil intent or good intention? And Jesus proceeded to list what harbors in the hearts of men, the things that defile men, evil thoughts, that is, evil reasoning. Really, the beginning of all the other sins in this list. And this is not just random thoughts that pop into your head. These are evil considerations. These are wicked reasonings. These are malicious contentions. That of the fallen, fleshly, sinful mind. The first fruit of the depraved mind is evil thoughts. The scheming, the calculating, the plotting to do evil. Genesis 6.5 tells us, Yahweh says that the evil of man was great on earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is the heart that is unredeemed, that is unclean, not renewed. Evil is not just out there in the world. It is in our hearts. The cesspool of sin in the world finds its source in the human heart. And unless Jesus Christ gives us a new heart, makes us a new creation, put his spirit in us, and so that by his spirit and with his spirit, we seek to put to death the deeds of the body. That is what will gush out, out of us as soon as it has the chance. Evil thoughts leads to murders, that is literally killing of a person, not the judicial execution or an act of war, but the illegal, intentional act of taking the life of another. And Jesus says that in the kingdom of heaven, under the law of Christ, anger is as good as murder in one's heart. Angry words, de demeaning language renders one guilty and worthy of the fires of hell. Spurgeon said, actual murders follow frequently upon unbridled passion. But forget not that the command, you shall not kill, may be broken by anger, hate, malice, and a desire for revenge. Many a murderer in the heart may be among us this day, being angry at his brother without cause. He that conceives and hides malice in his soul is a murderer before God. This form of evil breeds all manner of harm to society. Not only murders, and it really follows the, the commandments as they are given for us in Ten Commandments, murders, adultery, and fornication. Really, adultery describes the sexual intercourse of, between someone 
uh, or two people, a, ma a married person who, with someone else who are married or anyone else really, which is a subset of sexual immorality or fornication or porneia is the Greek word. Porneia really means sex sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage. Any and all sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage. And yet Jesus pointed out in the law of Christ that even a lustful look constitutes adultery. Where? In the heart. The heart is the fountain of infidelity. Long before anyone acts out in adultery or fornication, they wallow in the mire of illicit sex in their minds. It's MacArthur who said that the man who falls into sexual sin usually don't fall far. For they usually have descended from the mountain peak of sexual purity a long time ago in their minds. He continues, thefts, that is, stealing, whether it's pilfering like Judas did from the money bag or robbery like Barabbas. Thefts really included anything taken from another unjustly. It includes things like the underpayment of your workers, the withholding of, your, of wages, the exploitation of others through your trade. It's the incurring of debt with no hope or intention to repay that. All of that falls under thefts. And we have seen this start in the heart with evil thoughts, covetous thoughts, thoughts of discontent, thoughts of entitlement. He continues and says, false witness and slandering. False witness is to give a false representation of the facts, of the truth, it is to lie, it is to deceive, it is to misrepresent someone or some event. And slandering is the word blasphemy, literally to give an injurious report or to make a, a harmful, give a harmful account, an untrue account with the intent to hurt and to harm someone else. It's a speak, it's speech that seeks to win, wound someone's reputation, to defame someone, to discredit someone. And we, of course, slander or blaspheme God when we misrepresent him, speak evil of him. And we slander our fellow man when we do the same to them. These are the things that flow from the heart. These are, this is really the toxic waste, the toxic pollution that defiles a man. Not the failure to comply to external rituals and ceremonial washings. A profound statement which rocked the world of the disciples and the Jews of Jesus' day. And Jesus did not explain how to deal with the pollution of the heart at this time. But we can praise God for the full revelation of Jesus Christ. And we know that when... We place our faith in him, in his, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, his redemptive work. That is when he will give us a new heart. He will purify our hearts with his blood. He will transform our hearts. He will renew our hearts. And when we come with a new heart, a clean heart, cleansed by the Lord himself, then we can boldly come before the throne of grace. And we can appear before God in the confidence that we are accepted by him because we are in Christ. And again, though it's not explicitly mentioned, the implication is clear. Acceptable worship requires a new heart, a clean heart, a pure heart. Jesus said, blessed is the pure in heart, for they will see God. And through Jesus, we can offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God in him.
So when it comes to worship, the condition of the heart is critical. J.C. Ryle wrote, What is the first thing we need in order to be Christians? A new heart. What is the sacrifice God asks us to bring to Him? A broken and contrite heart. What is the true circumcision? The circumcision of the heart. What is genuine obedience? To obey from the heart. What is saving faith? To believe with the heart. Where ought Christ to dwell? To dwell in our hearts by faith. What is the chief request that wisdom makes of everyone? My son, give me your heart. True worship requires not ritual or ceremony, but a renewal of the heart. And, and we, we, we don't live under the Mosaic law. We, we are not Jewish. We don't have the same rituals and ceremonies of the Old Covenant. They are, they are foreign to us. But we have worship ceremonies and rituals of our own. Our spiritual disciplines, the reading of our, the Scriptures, in prayer, the giving of thanks before a meal, coming to church on Sunday, coming to the Lord's table, serving others, sharing the gospel, meeting in small groups, all forms of worshiping God. So let us cleanse ourselves from these defilements, evil thoughts, Murders, adultery and fornications, thefts, false witness and slander. When we come and do these things, let us confess our sin before him. So that we may receive and, and we understand that when we first come to salvation, the Lord gives us a new heart. He renews us. He, he circumcises our heart. We belong to him. And so if you have not done that today, then that is my appeal to you, that you would come today and circumcise your heart before the Lord. Seek His forgiveness for the defilement that is in your heart that makes you unacceptable to Him. And He promises that those who call on His name, that He will forgive you. And he will make you one of his own. But for us who know him and walk with him, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we don't come on a Sunday morning with any of these defilements in our hearts. That we not open our Bibles in the morning when we not speak to the Lord seeking his blessing for the day while we are harboring defilement in our heart. Let us make sure that we don't just trust in our rituals, in the mechanical, heartless, mindless practice of these rituals of worship, but that we come with a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that has been cleansed by Christ. Once for all and every day as we walk with him. Let me pray for us. Father, you desire truth in our innermost being. In what is hidden to others, out of the clearest day to you. Lord, you know our hearts. And we pray, Lord, purify. Purify us. Wash us with hyssop and we will be clean. We will be whiter than snow. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us 
Do not cast us away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with a willing spirit. Then we will teach transgressors your way and sinners will be converted to you. And we will enjoy the fellowship with Abba our Father through Christ our Lord. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.